But we begin tonight with the CEO of the county's Monaco DHB, who this afternoon told us she is really concerned about the effects of workloads on DHB staff and therefore on patients. Dr. Gl Dr. Gloria Johnson says they urgently need more staff and, quote, it isn't right people are being asked to work as hard as they've been asked to work this year. Now, this interview was in, in response to our revelation on Wednesday night that Counties Monaco was offering a voluntary cessation scheme to staff, including clinicians. Last night, we revealed that a New Zealand nurses organisation survey at the DHB had found that over 90% of nurses had experienced staffing shortages that had on occasion impacted on their ability to care for patients. Dr Johnson is adamant any savings achieved by allowing staff to leave will only be spent on frontline care. They are redistributing resources, not reducing them. But why do they need to redistribute resources at all? Oh, if you mean are we short of funds, yes we are. We've certainly got to be able to figure out a way of being able to fund an expansion of our clinical workforce and we're doing that at a time when we are actually in deficit. So that's challenging. How, mu how much are you in deficit? So we ended last year with a deficit of about $12.9 million. And your projections in your annual plan for this fiscal year, 17-18? $20 million deficit. Okay, so don't you need more money? In other words, if you weren't in the position of having a $20 million projected deficit for this fiscal year, would you be asking for voluntary redundancies? Well, first of all, we're not asking for redundancies. We're, it's a voluntary cessation scheme, and that is that is actually a quite an important distinction. Would um, you we're be, not looking to make Would you redundant. be running this scheme, this scheme. if you weren't we facing a $20 million deficit? We might well not have thought of it because it certainly came out of our thinking about what are all the kinds of things that we can do in order to try and ensure that we are, can free up some money in order to employ a bigger clinical workforce because that's clearly what we've got to do. So it is part of an, of an overall major savings plan that we are developing. As a result uh, and, and of... That savings, sorry? A, as a result of the fact that you are facing a $20 million... Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank yep. you. Thank you. For, thank you for being so straight about that. I'm confused about your fiscal position. If I go back to the annual report 2016, uh, and I look very proudly at you citing with good cause your successful completion of Treasury requirements of all public sector mm -hmm. entities for an investor confidence rating, you say the CMDHB received an initial A rating, one of only two public entities to date to have achieved such. So I think, gosh, that's impressive. I go and look mm -hmm. at Treasury. February of this year, February of 2017, your rating is still A. What yep. has happened? Why do you need to find savings now when Treasury was affirming you as an A rating as recently as February? So there are two, two key issues in that. Um, the first and probably most important is the um, incredible ex escalation in acute demand that we've experienced that really became apparent about December last year when we started experiencing a major increase in demand for our acute surgical services in particular. And that just kept going. Surgical services are generally a bit busier over the summer because of trauma and stuff, but uh, we had a sustained increase in demand that's just gone on and on and on. And then on top of that, when we had the usual increase in, West, in medical demand, um, we were dealing with uh, levels of requirement for clinical services that were far greater than we had anticipated, despite the fact that we always plan year on year to have to meet increasing demand. But it has really been quite extraordinary. Don't you need more money? If, if, sorry, yes, it really, so, I interrupted so, the phrase, and it's a yep, really salient phrase. Yep. It really has been quite extraordinary this year. You used yes. the word acute demand. Don't yes. you need more money? So to meet that acute demand, yes, we, we will. And this is a problem for the whole of metropolitan Auckland, not just for counties, and we think the major driver of it is the increase in population in Auckland, um, which we, our funding, our pop, as you know, is population-based funding. There are two issues with that for us in counties Manukau. One is that we don't think that it does sufficiently take account of the rate at which the population in Auckland is growing. So we might get funding that, you know, um, the projections for the for the rate of growth for the rest of the country, of course, are quite different. And we need to have funding that takes account of how quickly 
Auckland is growing. So you are underfunded, aren't you? Oh, from our perspective, we are. The uh, other uh, issue sorry, that we no, have sorry, particularly... Sorry, no, yep. I really want to yep. drill down into that. Let's yep. set aside your so, perspective. Well, uh, on on, on a population basis, you begin yep. the financial year yep. with a population-based model, funding model, that yep. is obsolete by the end of the financial year because of the rapid increase in Auckland's population. That's one of the two factors. The other is... So that's that, an absolute no, flaw. Uh, that's an absolute flaw in your so, funding model, isn't it? John, I want to talk about the other flaw in the funding model to do with population. The other problem that we have is that the census is used as the basis for that population calculation. And the census numbers for South Auckland in particular are quite inaccurate. They are a serious undercount. And we know that. We know there are many more people here than get counted in the census because of our population mix. You know, high migrant population, a lot of people um, living in circumstances that, that they don't want anybody to know about. So there's a serious undercount of the population here. And you so, and with so the, rather, than get, rather than get yeah. more money, you are facing a $20 million deficit mm -hmm. and you are asking for the voluntary cessation of employment agreements. I'm calling it redundancy. You're saying it's not redundancy. It feels, no. like me to this, feels like the same thing to me. In other words, you are having to cut costs and invite people to leave if they are so inclined because you don't have enough money to keep up with your growing population. That's right. We also have a lot of other things that we're having to do as part of our savings program as well, of course, looking at all of our programs of work, considering, you know, to what extent we might be doing things that are, um, you know, discretionary activities rather than core business. Uh, we do a lot of things that are still very useful things, but if they're not absolutely part of our core business, if we're this short of money, then we have to consider whether or not we really should be doing them. Now, you are asking if people would like to leave. We have a nurses survey which tells us very explicitly that 267 of the 272 nurses who answered have experienced short staffing in their ward or their team. In yeah. other words, you are doing it way tougher than you should be doing it because you don't have enough money. Yep. That's correct. I mean, we're really concerned about the effect of the workloads that we've been experiencing this year on our staff, as well as on our patients and their families. And people have continued to do an absolutely fantastic job, and we get amazingly positive feedback from people, even when it's incredibly busy. But it isn't right that people are being asked to work as hard as they have been asked to work this year. We need to be able to get more staff in place and have more facilities in which to treat people um, really quite urgently now. And so that's why we, we, we actually need more nurses and more doctors and more physios and so on and so forth. We need more people who can actually directly look after sick people. And if we look at the impact of, of that first question in the survey that I mentioned to you, have you experienced short staffing lately? If we go to the second question, do you ever feel that you've reached the limits of safe practice as a result of an acute staffing shortage? 264 responses, 246 were yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's very concerning. Um, and we did a similar survey with our um, medical staff in the general medical teams as well. And, um, and they came up with very similar answers and gave us very similar examples of just how difficult it had been to continue doing a good job, uh, particularly over our very busy weeks in June and so, July so and the, early August. Right, so this is a County's Monaco DHB survey, so you've done your own internal survey. We did our own internal survey and, of the and, medical and, staff right. after, after the NZNO had shared their survey of the nursing staff, and, and which it obviously greatly so, concerned us. Okay, yeah. and so your internal survey, more or less, in broad terms, matches the feedback that you're getting from the union? Yep, that's right, yep. So managers and unions agree that actually you are short-staffed? Yes. Yes. And, and, and we're not and just short, we're short staffed and we're short of facilities as well. We, we ran into an enormous problem with, with being over full during the winter as well. So we urgently need more facilities too. And capital expenditure is also a problem in DHBs in this country that we've, we've almost disincentivised to spend on facilities. And we don't actually spend a lot of money on facilities, which is why you'll find a lot of hospice, hospital facilities are in relatively poor condition uh, and it is quite difficult for us to be able to actually um, continue to expand and get new facilities because of the impact that that has 
on our budgets. And do, did your internal survey echo what the Nurses Union survey explicitly says, that there are staff, 246 of 264 respondents, who feel that they have reached the limits of safe practice as a result of an acute staffing shortage? Yes, yeah, so our survey was, we used, the, we used the same questions reworked for medical staff, and the medical staff expressed the same views as the nursing staff. What, yeah. That they've reached the limits of safe practice? Yes, yes, and that they were really concerned about the impact, the potential impact on patient care. And what people tell us is, you know, they, they still um, obviously practice as safely as they possibly can, but, um, but it's really stressful not only working really hard, but being aware of the fact that that may be having an impact on the quality of the job that you're doing as well. That's Dr Gloria Johnson, the CEO of the County's Monaco DHB in Auckland, of course. That interview and our revelations about the DHB earlier this week follow admissions from the southern DHB on checkpoint that unreasonably long delays in patient care have contributed to reduced life expectancy in patients with prostate cancer. Last month, Checkpoint reported on an internal paper from Capital and Coast Health prepared for the board and endorsed by its CEO that said, and I quote, the DHB is facing significant financial pressures. Also last month, a board member from the Waikato DHB told us on Checkpoint, and I quote, the reality is our staff are being told to find savings they just can't possibly achieve, which puts which puts pressure on them. In July, the Canterbury DHB expressed concerns that reducing its deficit would require making service cuts of an unprecedented scale. And then today, what you've just heard from Counties Monaco, they are recurring themes from DHBs throughout the country. We asked the Health Minister, Jonathan Coleman, for an interview today. We obviously wanted to discuss what Dr Johnson has told us in that interview you've just heard. And the similarities to what we've heard from other DHBs. His office replied, and I quote, staffing is operational and handled on the ground. And quote, it's also the government caretaker period and it wouldn't be appropriate for the Minister to comment.